All right, let's start. So um, welcome everyone. Just letting you know this session is being recorded. Um, kia ora, I'm Asher Anderson. I'm one of the trustees of Flora and Fauna of Aotearoa. Uh, welcome to our second discussion in an ongoing series on conservation issues and key concerns, as well as exploring how we can better engage with the complexity of our ecosystems. In the first video, I spoke with Dr. Wendy Pond, Les Kelly, Shane Hyde, who all shared their concerns, experience and knowledge in a really important conversation about predator-free 2050, um, that particular conservation strategy and the very, very real harms related to aerial poisoning. Um, and they shared some really interesting insights and it was a real eye-opener for me and I'm really grateful to them for sharing their thoughts. I'd highly uh, recommend uh, anyone who's interested watch that. It's on our YouTube channel. I might post it, uh, the link to it later in the chat. Also, I'd highly recommend um, that everyone read Les Kelly's book, Duped. I didn't have the chance to read it before that particular conversation, um, but I did afterwards and I, I it, it was wonderful. It was really an amazing um, insight and uh, all credit to Les and, and the people who were involved in, in exposing um, a lot of lot that has gone on. Um, highly recommend every Kiwi read that book. I'll post a link to that in the chat later as well. But uh, let's get on to today's conversation. Today I'm here with Trapper and Sustainable Wildlife Management Advocate, Marty Foote. Welcome, Marty. Good night. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm really excited to chat with you about your views on uh, current conservation issues, um, the predator-free 2050 policy and the development of community-led comprehensive wildlife management plans and the roles of contract trappers as well. So it's great to finally sit down with you and have this conversation. It's good to be here. Cool. So I have a few questions already lined up for you and um, we'll see where the conversation takes us. There's a lot of different topics that I'm sure will come up as we go. Um, but again, this is just creating a starting point for further discussions and connections to be made. Um, and opening up different ideas. So there, there will be time for some Q&A afterwards. Um, so if anyone listening now has any questions, um, just hold on to them till the end and, or you can pop them in the chat. So I'm just going to put off your um, camera, Flynn. So it's just Marty and I for this first one. Oh, sorry, Marty, I think I, put you off by accident. All right, that there we go, cool. So let me see. Um, here, so here we are, Marty, I just really, first of all, I guess I wanted you to introduce yourself a little bit and a little bit about your background as a trapper. Right, um, I... I was always keen on, on the bush trapping. I went the way through school when I first started skins. Um, and then I, I became, I did a few things, went over to Aussie for a while and, uh, and did some orchard contracting and then got serious about possum trapping. And ended up tying up with an old an old deer colour meat hunter, possum trapper. And I spent my first real professional season with him. And he taught me in that one season... <laughs> more than I could actually have learned in a decade working by myself. And he didn't actually teach me. I just learned by osmosis, if you like. And then after that, I worked with Kiwi Bear. We were live catching possums and cage finishing the fur skins and sending them off to auction overseas in, in Copenhagen. Um, following on from that, I, my first contract was in, in Marpa in, in the King Country in 1988, where I was a part of a team of trappers that successfully completed possum control at Marpra. Um, and then uh, Helen Clark and her wisdom told Doc that they, they were not to employ trappers anymore and that Aerial 1080 was going to be the, uh, the main main focus at, at Marpra, which they did three years in a row and still didn't achieve the results that they wanted. Uh, so, so that was my introduction to trapping, uh, contract trapping and the government and the way that they that they sort of been behaving. And that was way back in 1988. Um, following on from that, I um, did some, um, signed some co contracts where I was the main contractor and I had subcontractors working for me on a number of contracts and they were all mainly to do with um, water catchment areas 
um, within bigger blocks of aerial 1080 areas where the, where the community said, no, we don't want 1080 in aerial catchment areas. And it became pretty apparent that we were actually doing a better job than the surrounding 1080 areas. And I started saying, well, we want the opportunity to, to tender against aerial 1080 on an equal basis. We think that we'll do a better job. And I was told to shut up. Um, if you don't shut up and do what you're told, we won't sign any more contracts with you. I didn't shut up and they refused to sign any more contracts. They were actually honored that promise. And the, just when that, all that was happening, I went back to the WIRAP where I grew up. So I knew the WIRAP quite well and ended up doing some work on Glenburn Station where I um, was working under the supervision of Professor Morris, who was the, at the Massive University at that time, and proved that trappers by catching, by lowering possums to very low densities, virtually eliminating them and autopsying all the possums and finding where the, the possum TB hotspots were, um, we were able to eradicate TB, not only the possums, but also the cattle. So they were interrelated. Um, and the Animal Health Board, which was, was the precursor to Osprey and the Wellington Regional Council refused to allow our trappers to be able to operate, even though I proved it and had the backing of Professor Morris, who had been doing all the TB possum work up until that time. Um, and they basically said, no, no, we don't want trappers, we want TNA, we want to use our own, you know, our own business model. And so that then basically, then the real nasty stuff happened and, and trappers like me were basically kicked out of the industry and they were replaced with what is now commonly called input contractors that do what they're told when they're told and, and they get paid you know, whatever, whatever um, the powers that be say is all right. right. So that's basically my history in the trapping side of stuff. Could you just explain the difference between an input and an output contractor? Well, an input contractor is, is what's commonly used now. And an input contractor is paid to do an amount of work. So somebody in an office somewhere normally, you know, down at Wellington now, um, decides what work is to be done and how it is to be done. Like, you know, if they're using bait stations, how many you know, bait stations, how far apart, how far apart the bait station lines are. They will often give GPS coordinates and how often the bait stations need to be serviced. And the same with traps. They say, well, you run traps along these, along these lines and you set traps at these particular places. So they're basically told exactly what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And, and the contractor gets paid regardless of the result. So if the, if the operation's a failure, the contract still gets paid and nobody is accountable for the failure, even though that they've, you know, the, the, the guy that um, has created the input contract should be responsible for the failure. He's not, it's just something that happens. Now an output contract is where the person buying the services decides on the output so it decides on a possum density of 5% or a rat density of 5% or whatever it is. You know, they, they, they've got a specific outcome that they want. And then the contractor goes in and if he achieves that outcome, he gets paid. If he doesn't achieve the outcome, he doesn't get paid. So there's a really good incentive to ensure that the, um, the job gets done. Right. So, so that's really the difference. An output contractor guarantees his work and, and he, he, he manages his own way of going about things. He's not told what to do or how to do things. He just goes out there and does it. And when he achieves the result, that's when he gets paid. An input contractor is told exactly what to do on a day-to-day -day basis and blah, 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 just like a wage employee, basically, a glorified wage employee. And he gets paid regardless of the, um, of, of the result. And often an input contractor is actually paid on a weekly or fortnightly or monthly basis, as, as would a salary or wage worker get paid. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so what do you think led to this shift of trappers being forced out of the industry in that way and, and the, the favouring of, of aerial poisoning? Well, originally all the contracts were out for contracts. Going back to the 1980s when um, the, the Fair Producers Association, of which I was vice president, um, we and we were wealthy too because that, that was back in the days when skins were worth, worth good money and um, we couldn't be ignored. Um, we forced the, uh, you know, DOC and, and, and the, the pest board, the animal health board wasn't even around then, um, into allowing us to be able to run uh, output contracts. And MARPA was one of those contracts. 
and we consistently proved that we could do the job. So that they would they would dictate they would they would say, okay, we want the possums down to this density. Go ahead, you know, give us your price. We gave them the price, and then we go off and do the job. And then and we always we always succeeded, and we got paid. So that was the normal way of doing contracting. And then um, and then the aerial, you know, bit, around 1990 with the formation of the Animal Health Board. Um, the, the real big push for aerial 1080 came on, and it, and and the Animal Health Board actually tried to get the aerial 1080 contracts to sign contracts to sign output contracts, but the aerial 1080 contractors knew that they had a failure rate, and Bruce Warburton and um, uh, you know in the mid 1990s showed that the, the failure rate was around 20 percent, which means that they couldn't effectively compete with output contractors because output contractors don't have failures, and 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 so. The powers that be then supported the um, you know the 1080 industry by winding down the output contracting side of things, and they did this in an underhanded sort of a way too, because they employed people on output contracts that had never had any contract experience, and so they were employing inexperienced contractors who were putting in prices that were too low, so they were undercutting the experienced contractors, and they, they honestly thought they could do the job, but then when they went in and they couldn't do the job with the money. They would they had, 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 had you know committed to, and they were failing. The um, the, the animal health board would come along and, and the regional councils would come along and, and say, okay, you, you you don't know what you're doing. You can't fail. You're an output contractor, output trapping contractor. Here we'll give you a little bit of money, and then just go away. And then they would use those failed results as an example of how bad trappers were. But they were but but they would always ignore. Um, the, you know, the, the good travelers that were doing a good job and completing and, you know, successfully doing it. So, so that, that's how, and then progressively the, the output contractors were pushed to one side and, and the work was progressively moved more and more to input contract. There have always been output contractors. And, you know, some of the guys that, that I started with in the, in the 80s and 90s, they have been successfully employed right up to almost virtually to today. But they've been and they've been paid very well, and they've been told to shut up, get on and do the job. And a lot of the jobs that they've been doing, they've been cleaning up failed poison operations. So in operations that have failed, you know, poison operations, and they know that they can't keep the failure secret, or for whatever reason they need to have the job done properly, they put a quietly put in good output tripping contractors to clean up the mess that they created. Oh, wow. so, so, and that's happening behind the scenes. No, and I've been told this, but the output contractors that are doing the work or have done the work haven't been able to publicly tell people what they're doing because they've been told if you do that, you won't get any more contracts. And yeah. they've also had um, confidentiality clauses written into their contracts, which basically means, although it's, you know, I, I, it was challenged, I, I, I doubt that they would get away with it, would basically mean that they could actually be prosecuted for breach of contract if they did talk about what the work that they were doing. Mm. There's some pretty nasty behind the scenes shen you know, shenanigans that have been going on with the output contracts. Yeah, wow. <laughs> That's a lot to take in, to be honest. Mm. So would you... Um... What are your thoughts on this predator free 2050 policy, you know, and, and with conservation heading in, in that direction? What do you think about the concept of eradicating, you know, these animals from the entire country as an actual conservation strategy? Well, they've admitted they can't do it. It's <laughs> the first thing. Predator free has said with today's technology, we can't do it. It's an aspiration only. Um, and we've got you know, we've got technology that will be able to manage possums and rats and you know, all animals at levels where they don't, you know, where they, where they don't cause harm to native wildlife. And, and, you know, we can, and, and that's good. what the scientists call impact density is the density at which wild animals are at, the density at which they start causing damage to native wildlife. And if you know what that impact density is, all you have to do is maintain the animals below that impact density. This is where our contracting comes along, because that will vary from place to place and forest to forest and ecosystem to ecosystem. And if, if you say, OK, in this ecosystem, we want possums at 10% RTC, um, that, then the, the, the trapper just knows what he needs to do to maintain it. There. 
and then some someone you might want to have a very low you might have a very sensitive area and you might need to go down below five percent rtc now, you can't do that with a poison operation but mm. a trapper can he, he can adjust what he's doing um to to allow for that sort of um you know, you know that, that those sort of impact variable impact densities now going back or you know they, they keep talking about um what paul Gallagher and his his idea in my reading of what he was he wasn't saying he was saying sometime in the future we can look at eradication but what he was talking about was setting up halo areas of, of, of virtual eradication and then allowing the halos to spread out and the animals would be learning outside the halo areas and if they could do stuff in the halo areas then they could start spreading it out and in fact what he was saying don't even try it on the mainland go down to Stewart island and make the proof of concept down there which is a whole lot different from what they've been promoting, and they've been mis in my, my opinion, they've been misrepresenting what Gallo has actually said and, 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 and advised to happen. But it's my impression of better to free. Mm, yes, I mean, well, despite the fact that it may be an aspirational goal, it's not going to um, stop the amount of money and effort um, and time wasted on such a massive, you know, distraction that doesn't take into consideration things like what you're talking about which is that the fact that eradication is not necessary, you know, that we have to actually take a more nuanced approach and look at the impact densities of these animals and whether it's actually necessary, you know, um, to control them in, in certain areas. And, and I think the conversation, um, you know, that I had with Les and Shane and Wendy really got me thinking, because I, you know, really felt like the eradication aspect of it is so fanatical but I came away with a better understanding that in certain areas that may be necessary but you know in terms of trying to do this for the entire country it's just com completely unnecessary and you end up actually missing I think a lot of the ecosystem services and the relationships and roles that have already developed with some of these introduced species which I mean you've shared with me before um information around the actual value you know the, the ecological value of some of these animals as well so a well, more nuanced approach uh, you know is well, well, a, 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 the, the, the interactions between it's not just interactions between introduced animals and native species there are interactions between the introduced species as well of course. and and the you know one of the big ones is interactions between possums and rats and if you lower possums to very low numbers the rat numbers automatically increase so there's a competition element there and it isn't it isn't food you know that possums aren't eating rats and, and they're not competing for the food and i believe what the competition element is is dry winter den sites because neither possums or rats can survive a wet new zealand winter without having a dry place to sleep and and if you take out all the possums well then you've got all these big what a rat would call a mansion and it's nice and dry and, and they can do what they do so that they start the spring at a higher at a higher density than whatever so, so that, and that happens every single time they lower the possum numbers and the rat numbers go up um so th this idea of, of attacking possums the way they're doing it is guaranteeing that they are going to have a much much larger rat problem than they originally had so they, they, they say, we've got a possum problem, so we're going to deal with that. And then they create another problem for themselves and they have to go and deal with that. And then there's probably going to be other problems. They're not thinking through what their unintended consequences are. And in fact, sometimes I think they know the unintended consequences and they intend them to happen so that they, they can continue their, um, you, know, you know, their business model, if you like. Well, the I mean... other thing about rats is that I, Back in the days when I was actually listening to RNZ, when I actually had some sort of respect for the reporting that was going on there, um, it was one of the Our Changing World programs and a, a bat scientist was being interviewed and he was studying bats in one of the barrier islands. And, and he, he was, you know, they, they were, had cameras and they were seeing what they were doing at night and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and he said, well, you know, the bats are one of the big pollinators, one of the main pollinators of a lot of our native trees. And the interviewer said, well, if the bats are the main pollinators of the native trees, what's happening on the mainland where there are no bats? And he said, oh, the ship rats are doing the job. Wow. So if you did manage to eradicate all the ship rats and there weren't any bats, you wouldn't have any pollination of some of our trees. And if you don't have pollination of the trees, 
you don't have seed. If you don't have seed, you don't have stuff to feed the birds and you don't have the seed germinating to re, re, you know, repopulate the forest. So there's an unintended consequence that they know about because the bat scientists have said, <laughs> this is what's going on, and yet they're ignoring it. Yeah, right, yeah. And that just made me think as well, one of the unintended consequences that could be used to reinforce the perceived need for aerial poisoning is, is the, the, the rat booms that happen you know, after after aerial poisoning, you know, that the rats bounce back a lot faster and you end up with these rat plagues and, and it goes, you know, it goes around again. Look, we need to we need to keep battling the rats. Um, but that's fascinating about the rats being pollinators. Um, Nora Shayab actually shared with me a little while ago a study about possums and possums uh, as seed dispersers for some of our native um, plants and species. So, I mean, they are actually fulfilling that same role in a different way. So, I mean, all of this stuff needs to be taken into consideration, especially when, um, you know, the native species that would have traditionally done a lot of that are just not there in, in the numbers that they need to be to continue to be able to do that. And that's where the balancing act comes in, because in the case of rats and bats, Okay, you may want to lower the numbers of rats, but you want to do it in a balanced way. So you lower the rats and you allow the bats to, you know, you know, to grow in number, and and you balance it in a way so that the bats can survive. And and and, and you know, I don't think you're ever going to eradicate rats. I mean, at the end of the story, and so you you lower the rats to a point where they can still do pollination and allow the bat numbers to increase. And, you know, somehow you've got to find that balancing act. And nobody knows what that balancing act is. And nobody will know until you actually start asking the questions and, and, and going in there and doing. That's right. And I think that's where the comprehensive wildlife management plans really come into play. Would you and like... it would be different for every forest. I mean, it's not a one-size-fits-all deal like they're trying to, you know, create the aerial 1080 bombardments. No, that's right. Do you want to share a little bit about um, what a comprehensive wildlife management plan is and, and how it might might work? Well, my, visit, you know, my vision of it is um, if, if you take a forest, a you know, Pukati forest or Kiriwoi or wherever, you know, uh, it doesn't matter where it is, but it's a forest somewhere and you, you take it as your central point. And the, and the communities around that forest get together and they make decisions, or the community around that forest make decisions about what the, um, you know, the, the native wildlife values in there are, what the problems are, and, and how, to, how to manage the situation so that the you know, native wildlife biodiversity can improve and you know, all those good words that, that Doc throws around and doesn't really um, follow through on. And then work out you know, with regards to uh, introduced animals, work out what the impact densities are. So what are the impact densities of possums that, so that, you know, that are causing damage to vegetation or whatever? And then whatever that impact density is, well, that's the level at which you want to maintain them below. And if it's, you know, when I'm talking with one of the scientists, they've been having trouble getting impact density, funding for impact densities because the government doesn't want to find them. But he was saying that one of the... Uh, one of his students did finally manage to get some impact density funding to look at one particular area. What she found was that the possum impact density was 15% RTC, which in good, which in times of good, um, you know, fur prices is actually within range of a fur harvester. You don't need to put any money in; you just need to encourage people to go in there and harvest furs and skimps. Um, and that's the sort of thing that a wild, comprehensive wildlife management plan will find. And, and, and then you work out how much um, how much money you need to put in there to maintain that. And, and, and you know, talking with uh, John Innes, who, uh, people would probably know his name, and he he was talking from his basis with um, Kokako. And what he said was that when Kokako numbers are very low, um, you do need a very low rat impact density. Um, you know, to, in order for the, the Kokoka numbers to recover. But once the Kokoka numbers are recovering and have recovered up to whatever the carrying capacity is for that forest, the rat, in rat impact density also goes up. So you don't need to keep the rats very low so long as you've got a resilient Kokoka population. And, and the, the big key to the whole thing is that you maintain 
the rats at a stable density. You don't allow, you know, the boom bust cycles that cause the problems. And then he said, if you maintain the um, the rat density at, at a stable level, you don't need to worry about controlling stoats because the stoats manage their uh, manage their density with their preferred feed, which is rats. So, mm -hmm. so long as you keep the rats stable, you don't have to worry about stoats. Stoats look after themselves and they don't cause a problem to, to native wildlife. So, so there's two things that the government knows about because they funded this work, but they don't talk about it, you know, when they're talking about the credit free type stuff and, and the need to kill rats and kill rats and kill stoats and that sort of stuff. And in fact, if you've got a balanced environment, you don't have to do a lot. Mm, yes, I mean, that's the, the biggest part of this equation really is the fact that that uh, a lot of these native species, the numbers are so so far down that, that they are so vulnerable. Um, but getting back to that point of, you know, of creating an environment where their numbers can bounce back and then finding that, you know, the impact density. Yeah. So how would you go about finding out an impact density? How do you crunch, <laughs> you know, it's a, a lot of observation and data collection, I guess. Um, over time well in order to do that i mean work out what your native values are i mean you know a really easy one to talk about is that everybody can see for themselves is you know goats and deer and, and browsers and things i mean the big problem with browsers is, is that if they're overpopulated they eat everything out so there's no regeneration of forest the forest every time seeding grows up it gets eaten and so you, you can man you, you can find out what the, the deer or goat impact density is by counting the number of seedlings. And if there are enough seedlings surviving to, to get above browse height and, and are able to grow into the canopy, then that is below the impact density. If you're at a point where all the seedlings are, are, are getting chewed out, then you're then you're above the impact density. And so you've just got to work out what that level is and then find a measurement of, of how do you measure that you can't go around and count the view of the things. And in Europe, you know, they regularly use pellet counts to work out exactly this equation in the European forests. And it works for and the American forest, and it works very well for them. But New Zealand government says, oh no, no, we can't do that. New Zealand's different. I'm sorry, not. <laughs> and so there are ways that you can do that, but but they're just not being looked for and they're not being, you know, talked about and, and, and stuff. Yeah, sure. Yep. But, but from my point of view, when you're dealing with comprehensive wildlife management plans, those relationships between introduced animals and finding those impact densities is relatively straightforward because you know what the, the, the native wildlife is, you know what you want it to look like, you, you, you know how many um, kokako you want to fledge, you know how many seedlings you want to be able to come up through, um, you know what the outcomes you want are. So you should be able to work out the impact density. And then, you know, a good hunter and trapper will be able to work out the most effective way of maintaining those, um, you know, you know th 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 those animal densities. And we shouldn't even be talking about it because, you know, the trappers will just get out there and do it. I mean, that's what they did when we were on our output contract. They didn't need to be told what to do. They were just told what the target is and they just went out and did it. And then they got paid. And the same thing will happen. Yeah. I think the... the, the, the big benefit of comprehensive wildlife management plans is that the communities will be able to talk about the values they have towards their environment and their forests. And, and, and they will be able to start taking ownership and responsibility for the decisions that are being made. And there will be human values that are a part of that. It's not just native wildlife um, densities and things. There are human values that are there, like, you know, gathering, fishing, you know, hunting and gathering which is not just introduced fish and animals, it is uh, you know, gathering you know, medicinal herbs and things, native medicinal herbs, and, and you start getting the people with different interests in the forest talking together, that's what creates a comprehensive wildlife management plan. It is community created, owned by the community, and is being managed for the benefit of the forest and the native wildlife and the community. That's, Absolutely. That's, and um, the real benefit I, I can see is, is with the communities itself and strengthening the communities. Oh, 
hang on there. I was just trying to mute somebody. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Marty. And I think that that's an area that has um, really been neglected that, you know, communities have actually been like tr contract trappers, like trappers have been shut out of these decision-making processes. Um, the communities have also, you know, and that's been my experience up here in, in the far north and, and connecting with um, communities actually all around the country that particularly people that live around these forests in particular are not being listened to. Um, and so it's really become quite a farce. Um, and, and I think that once we are actually acknowledged as stakeholders alongside the hapu and the iwi, um, and that, that governance can come down to a, a community grassroots level, I think that um, we can actually start to really make solid progress rather than this solid top-down yeah. monopoly because it's basically a monopoly and, and we're being forced into situations where these areas close to our homes are being aerially poisoned. Um, and, and it's not just about that. It's about the water. It's about, it's about the animal welfare. You know, from, from my perspective, I would rather have a human being who is res directly responsible um, actually in that role you know, in that kaitiaki role. And and then the, um, you know, the economic value as well as the cultural value of these animals can be recognised. Yeah, well, there's other things here, you know, we're just talking about, uh, you know, we're just talking about, you know, food and hunting and gathering for, for food, but there's actually a huge economic resource. That, you know, with the meat, the meat and the skins and the fur that's just being left to rot. Well, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that are just being left to rot on the ground. And that, that's a travesty. I mean, that, that's criminal in my, my opinion. You know, I'm a trapper and I can see the value and, and I like doing gathering that, but just to leave millions of dollars worth of product just to rot on the ground simply because you don't like them and you don't want to attach a value to them is, is just important to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, um here we are in, in an economic downturn and people are struggling financially and we're wasting all this money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and, it, and it's not about money and it's not about exploitation. I mean, it's really about, <clears throat> you know, um, the limited resources that rural communities have um, and having access to actually really nourishing healthy kai and rongoa and, 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 as is our, what I think is our inherent right, is to interact and be a part of our environment in that way. Um, you know, and I think that the absolutely, the cultural and economic value of possums in particular is something that is totally ignored. You know, there are a lot of people up where I live who actually rely on some income from collecting possum fur, you know, and they are doing a, a very, very important service to you know, to the forests in our area to actually keep those possum numbers managed. Um, and, and you know, that economic uh, prosperity that comes from that, you know, remains in our local community. When you have aerial operations and hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent on helicopters and imported poisons, I mean, where's the local p procurement policies? You know, how, how are we keeping keeping this this wealth within our own region so that our own local communities can benefit from it? It actually becomes a very extractive model that that we have at the moment, um, which I think is needs to be flipped on its head. And, you know, the potential for us in these times of um, economic downturn and, um, you know, and environmental, huge environmental issues being able to adapt and actually, um, you know, view view not these animals as resources, but actually, you know, stack functions. That's kind of how, how I see it. You know, you have a, a list of issues. Why not solve all these issues with actually a solid plan that addresses those, those complex issues? And I think that having, you know, um, output contractors, input contractors, local communities, you know, individuals, doing this work and and for that wealth to be retained in the region is really really important and also to give them the sense of contributing to their environment you know and improving the situation because i mean like for example at the pukati forest um, and other forests in this area there are very vulnerable species that need that added layer of protection but coming at them with aerial poisonings is, is actually just going to make the problem worse 
And then it's this sporadic funding too. I mean, there is no commitment by a central government. I um, mean, I've received the Pukati newsletters and they're saying that the, uh, what was the latest um, bribe that went on at the last election, the, the funding for nature, whatever it was. Jobs for nature. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and they were encouraged to, to invest in setting up the whole program based upon this funding and now it's all gone. I mean, and that's happening right across the country, but apparently about 90% of that funding is just suddenly gone. You know, sorry, I'm not going to pay for that anymore. There is no long-term planning or commitment. It's all to do with, um, they're going to put in this money now so that we can get votes and then we don't care later on. I mean, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with conservation. No, well, and these things could be self-sustaining. You know, if you, if you have con contractors um, and individuals doing this work and they are able to recoup you know, through through the harvesting of these resources while also getting the work done that helps to get the biodiversity gains. You know, that that is not relying on a handout. That's actually a very democratic, self-sustaining, um, you know, way, way of, of having the local economy go around. So I think that... That's where, that's where the impact densities are important because in a, in a, in a situation like I talked with before where you've got 15%... Um, you know, RTC is the impact density. You don't need to pay the contract or anything. You just got to create an environment that is 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 um, uh, conducive to encouraging them to be there. Which could be just maintaining traps or putting a hut in or, or you know some sort of infrastructure that not only the trapper will be able to use, but but the community will as well. You start getting down to ten percent or below. Um, then you do need to, to start paying the you know the, the trapper something because he's not going to be able to recover his costs out of out of you know the animals he's doing. But you know the higher the impact density, the less that cost will be. So it's only when you get down to the very sensitive areas where you're almost trying to eradicate possums from a from an area that's when it becomes expensive. But most of what Doc's trying to do, we don't need sort of expense for possums anyway. Um, that is, that is being thrown at the problem because we don't need those very low densities. You know, they're going for you know three and five percent RTC targets when in fact that the the impact density the scientists have already said the impact density is actually around ten percent RTC. Mm -hmm. And so they're wasting all and then when they lower the possum densities to way below what they should be, they create the rat problem as we talked about. So you know, but but, but you're right. We we, we diverted away from the you know the, the recovery the, the, the financial recovery from returns of the animals being done. Yeah, uh, and I think, well, like Shane Hyde points out, um, you, that we need to support the people who are already doing this work, you know, and not ex exclude them, the local people who are already doing this work. And when I think of the hunters and trappers, I think they are first and foremost the real conservationists, you know. These are the guys who are managing the pig numbers. But at the same time, they're also feeding their whānau and they're also feeding the people who come to the tangi. You know, and that is such an important cultural service that they provide. So it's, yeah, I think we really need to flip things around. Um, I remember from the previous conversation, Wendy mentioned that in the Coromandel and some of these forests, because of the aerial poisoning, the pig hunters that were usually keeping the pig numbers under control weren't hunting anymore. And so the pigs were actually getting out of control and causing other issues in the forests and in the farmland so it's yeah it's it's time we actually start to give credit and support i think um you know people hunters and trappers who are doing this work and actually as you say get the communities more involved so that there's less of an inclination for it to become an exploitative thing and it and it actually becomes more of a, a communal kind of improving the biodiversity of the forest while also allowing for this wild harvest to to take place responsibly. And that's where the impact density is also important because if you've got a known number of you know density of pigs or deer, you know, things that people want to harvest for, for either financial or personal, you know, feeding, feeding, you know, support or feeding of their whanau and things. Um, if there is a known impact density that 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 is that is agreed to and is going to be sustained there, then the hunters know that if if the animals get above that impact density, somebody else is going to come in and control it. Because that, that's it. I mean, the community has said, okay, this is the impact density for this area for pigs or deer or whatever, and it gets above that, we're going to have unacceptable damage. 
So then there's an incentive for the there's an incentive and a target for the recreational and commercial hunters to if they don't want somebody else coming in and, and, and controlling it, there's an incentive for them to maintain it at that impact density. And the only reason why there would be you know professional hunters going in there to do it is if the local hunters or the recreational you know the people that are feeding themselves are unable to do it themselves and then they need support they need help to get the numbers down there the problem is that with with, with deer and pigs and that sort of thing the hunters don't even know what the what the impact density is and neither does doc doc just makes a decision oh well we've got a heap of money this year let's go out and kill some deer or some pigs and they go you know upset all, all the all, all the recreational hunters there is no planning. There is no real targets. It's just let's kill as many as we can. Yeah, that's that's a big it's a big part of the problem, really, isn't it? Um, mm. but actually, I heard of somebody. Um, I was talking to somebody on the Coromandel about this in pigs, in an area that she's in. They're not actually really poisonous. They're bait station possums and rats, but they're using they're using a poison and they're doing it every year, and they're using a poison that means that um, the pigs must have a, uh, a 12 month you know stand down period you know a 12 month period where, you, where you're not able to harvest half the poison now they're coming in every year so that there's no way the pigs can be harvested for meat and she says that there are pigs everywhere they're rooting up paddocks and they are causing the problems you were talking about now that's deliberate <laughs> they know what they're doing they can't be stupid enough to know that there's a 12 month stand in period and they're poisoning every 12 months, that there would be absolutely zero incentive for anybody to hunt pigs. Yeah, that's that's another actually really, really massive issue is the contaminated meat, um, which Kathy and Kathy White and Clyde Graff um, did a really good um, testimony, wonderful testimony to the People's Inquiry. And it's that's a real concern up here in Northland. So it's just another reason why we need to actually stop using these residual toxins, um, that particularly like brodificum that build up in the body of these animals. And then you have an unsuspecting hunter come along and hunt this animal, which can actually travel. I mean, how many kilometers can a pig travel? Very, very far outside of, you know, bait station or aerial poison operation areas. So it's just... It, it's just actually shocking that this this is still used while people are still harvesting these animals. It's yeah, shocking it's being used when there is a credible non-toxic alternative oh, that has absolutely. been proven to be able to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I've got, let me just check if I've got any more questions and then maybe we could open up for some other questions if anyone has any. I see Steph's got one there in the chat. So... I, you know, you you got in touch with me in 2018. Um, you sent, you wrote to me, um, quite a lengthy letter, as you do, Marty, <laughs> and I really appreciated it. And you, you know, it was at the time when we had actually just exposed the fraudulent consultation that had happened up here for an aerial poison operation, and the hapu local hapu had got a hold of it, and basically that aerial poison operation was stopped, but. You you got in touch with me and and I really appreciated you know all the knowledge and information that you were willing to share and one of the things that I noticed was that you don't use the word pest you use the word word wild animals and and I've been doing that as well ever since because I really loathe this idea you know the and the and the overuse of the word pest would you just share a little bit why you think it's important to use the term wild animals. Well, there, are, there are two terms that I don't use. One is pest and one is control. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's wild animals that are pest and management instead of control. And um, the pest side of things, well, a pest is something that is in the wrong place and it's doing damage. And, and so the wild animals that are just doing about their things in a, in, a, in a balance with things, they're not pests. They're just wild animals. And, and in my opinion, the, the word pest in New Zealand has been totally overused. And it is being used to demonise, um, you know, demonise some animals that aren't pests at all. And you know, and, and in some areas, possums are not pests. I mean, they're not big enough numbers to actually do any damage, so you can't call them a pest. And yet, they, you know, it's, so that's the reason why I, I do it. I, you substitute the word wild animal was to differentiate my 
um, interpretation of what animals are from the you know the extreme military exterminate everything type um, things that the predator free are, are you know, sort of promoting. But I accept that wild animals can become pests in certain circumstances, you know, where their numbers do rise to a point where they're causing damage. At that point, they they are they do they are pests like like beings. But if you lower the numbers down below the impact density, they cease to become pests. They just become a part of the environment. So they're just wild animals. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm just muting someone. Thanks. And Doc hates the, using the word wild animal. <laughs> yeah, I'm so right. my, I have a request where I've been talking about wild animals. They've actually written back to me and tell, told me on one, one email, one reply, that they wouldn't communicate with me if I continued to use the word wild animal for what they to turn to be a pest. <laughs> That's really interesting because um, what the, the legislation basically uses the term wild animal. I, you know, so it doesn't use the, the term pest, it's it's wild animal. So I think that that's a really important distinction that we that we make. Um, it's a, for me, a, a pest, I totally agree with you, you know, it's like it's like a weed, it's a plant in the wrong place, you know. <laughs> and I think that it's it's really important psychologically to to get away from that absolute fanatical um aspect of complete eradication of every one of these species because we completely ignore the cultural and economic value and as well as the ecological value which we have been talking about you know the other ecosystem services that are just you know doc is not even talking about the nuance and it's like rats being a food for the more pork and for the weka and for other native species, you know, and to think that they can completely eradicate them and what do they think is going to happen? So I really, you know, the comprehensive wildlife management plan, while it's, you know, there's there's a lot to it. And I think, um, you know, to create a really workable plan, there would be probably quite, you know, quite a bit of effort involved. But for each, each unique area, whether it's a wetland, whether it's a forest, whether it's a, a dune a dune area, you know, with vulnerable species, I think that this concept can be, you know, effectively applied to each individual area. And I think getting the local community involved as well as the, the iwi and the hapu to develop the governance and the structure around how that's done responsibly, you know, is a really, um, would be a really important way to move forward. How do you think that we could get started on doing this kind of thing? Well, it has to be from the ground up. Communities have to make a decision that that's what they want to happen. Um, and I've been asked, you know, can I provide a template? And I said, no, because it, it's not the sort of thing you can make a template for, because it's something that will be developed by the communities for their environment, which will be different from other communities. And they may have different values um, in that community, you know, different human values in that community to another community with a similar environment. And it, so that comprehensive wildlife management plan must be something that the community decides is important to them. And then they can, then they can create, you know, then they decide, okay, what are the native, um, um, the, the, the native elements here that we want to protect and enhance? You know, what are the problems that we've got? And in some areas, weka are actually a problem because, because, because weka are, 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 are predators <laughs> they do the same job as stoats on theo you know, so, so you work out what the problems are whether they be most of them will be introduced animals but some native animals will be causing problems and then you work out what the impact densities are and how you want to manage them and then you get on and do the job and in managing the whole environment you may be able to do things that don't involve killing animals in order to enhance the environment to create a positive um, environment for the animals that you're trying to you're trying to help but yeah. without sitting down and, and analyzing it and talking with the people that know the areas you know uh, are passionate and, and know the areas intimately you don't have a chance and, and that's the key is to be able, and it must come from the community if the community isn't not united and agreeing on what needs to be done it, it, it's doomed to failure because yeah. because the community must be strong enough to stand up the central government and say no we, you know, we want we want the sort of things that you say that you want, 
but we want to do it this way. And instead of spending the money the way you want it to be spent, we'll spend it the way we want it to be spent and we'll end up with the same, if not a better outcome than the one that you're trying to get in our community. And, and so in the end, it, it must be the communities that, that are united and strong enough to be able to, to create that environment for themselves. Yeah. And a united community has, has, got a, has got far more power than the central government. The united community can't be told what to do by the government because they, they will be strong enough to say no. This is our community. You can't tell us what to do. But, it's, yep. but the problem is the problem is that our communities are so fractured at the moment and, and somehow we've got to find a way of, of bringing them together. And um, the Comprehensive Wildlife Management Plan is a really good start for, 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 because everybody agrees on the things that we want. I don't think anybody disagrees that we, we want a, a better environments and forests and ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just pick up on one of the things that you mentioned there about um, other other ways of of improving um, native native biodiversity and supporting supporting them without actually killing. <laughs> you know, that doesn't involve killing. And I, you know, I think that um, that is, I think, a really interesting area that really needs to be explored. I think there's a lot of wonderful ideas out there as well. You know that that. Um, can be picked up to actually uh, trialed and experimented with you know nesting nesting boxes and I, I saw an article recently about some kia nesting boxes that had been carved into some um, I think old uh, some pine pine trees that have been cut down and they were doing an experiment to see if the kia would um, would actually use these hollow purposefully hollowed out logs and then and they started to so it's there's there's all these other different kinds of ways that, you know so I think that it's one of the things that I mentioned in the previous video was opening up to all these different expressions of conservation as well, you know, and I think when you get the community involved, because there's so many different people that make up our communities, you, you actually start to create a space where these things can be explored and integrated into something like um, a wildlife management plan. That's quite an exciting you get a group of people like that together, an odd ball will just pop out of the boat. And some of them will actually work. And so things will be being done in the future that nobody would even consider would be, you know, they haven't even thought of today. And and some of the ideas will be pretty simple. I mean, that happens, like your idea of the hollowed out um, tree log. Why didn't we think of that 50 years ago? I mean, this yeah. is the, but only communities can do that. They, those sort of um, things cannot be thought of and conceptualized in Wellington. Because the bureaucrats just simply are not, not on that wavelength. They don't yeah. care. Yeah, that's one of the fundamental issues with this entire thing, that it's it's people who are so far removed from these areas who are trying to make decisions about them. You know, so it's people on the ground who live there, who know that whenua, who know that place, who, who are there because, you know, and when you're there and you're present, you have those skills of observation to be able to start to actually understand input, you know, um, impact densities and and understand the habits of of these, you know, that what's present within these areas. So, coming back to local communities is is exactly how it needs to go. Marty, just before we open up, is there anything else you would like to say? Would you like to share anything else about your vision for the future evolution of conservation? Like five to ten years, what do you think would be the ultimate thing to like happen to kind of get us away from the current paradigm. Well, obviously, you know the you know the, the development of comprehensive wildlife management plans that we talked about would be great. Um, uh, but but even without that, I mean, you know, my experience as a trapper and a contract trapper is that we have the ability to be able to replace aerial 1080 with contract trapping within five to 10 years. And in order to do that, we all we need to do is train 400 people, uh, you know, 400 new trappers to a, a standard, you know, to an output contracting standard that used to be common, in, you know, 30 years ago. And, and that's not a huge number of people. That's only 400 people. We'll have to start, you know, 4,000, because only about 10% of them will make it through to that, you know, to that sort of standard. But that, that is a target that we can achieve. And we find those 400, we can replace virtually all the areas that are currently being done with aerial 10 And we'll be able to do it cost effectively with 10 
Well, I suppose it has to start with a few, a few, a few specific communities. Um, and I can think, you know, up here in Northland and in the Coromandel in particular, these are areas where there is really strong support for for developing this kind of thing in order to shift us away from the um the aerial poisoning that's happening that's actually doing so much damage. So we are working on it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, more, I'm more than happy to become involved with any communities. And the people have always, particularly travellers, they're always stunned by um, the fact that I'll actually travel and, and, and basically give away for free what they what they believe is their own intellectual property rights, if you like. And, and I, I see that as counterproductive. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, that, that's actually a good point. And I think that's... Uh will be a, an important part of this process is the, is the kite in the middle, you know, the basket in the middle where we can all put our experiences and knowledge so that we can actually support each other on this journey and learn from each other's experience and knowledge and get away from this very closed guarded, you know, it's my, you know, it's, it, you know, I don't want to share my tips and techniques with you, you know, yeah. that, that, that ultra competitive, um, you know, uh, way way of being. I think we we need to get past that because that becomes, that's friction, you know. And I think that in order for this to work, we have to we have to start to become open and be willing to share, um, and support. And I think that's yeah really important. So I'm really grateful that you that you do do that and that you um you know you are willing to share your experience and knowledge. I see we've got a first question. Um, shall we open up for questions now? Go for it. All right, all right. If anyone's wanting to join us on the camera, please just feel free to turn your camera on and um, and your microphone. And we, I can see there's a couple of couple of good questions already. Maybe I'll just read them out. So we've got a question from Stephanie. So great discussion, Asha and Marty. Question, has there been a credible study done on comparing the true cost of aerial poisoning versus trapping regime over the same area and ecology type? Well, there used to be. I mean, going back to the 1980s, that was the whole focus of the fur producers. And we were working with scientists like, um, uh, like Bruce Morgan and you know, those old DS. I mean, I don't even think that. Perhaps it was just in transition from DSIR to land here, but we were dealing with DSIR scientists, and that was exactly what was going on. And we were out competing. You know, we were on a on a par, if not cheaper, than, than Aerial 1080. Um, and that was part of the problem. And then that's when they decided, oh, well, we just don't want to do possum, we want to do rats as well. And, and then, you know, so we had to learn how to do rats. The Travis needed to learn how to do rats. But yes, and now um, I am confident enough to be able to put in a uh, possum only contract for around ten dollars a hectare a year, and a, a, a possum, you know, a multi-species contract for about twenty dollars a hectare a year. Now, aerial tenacity, even though the, the powers that be won't won't admit it, is costing anywhere between sixty and hundred dollars a hectare per operation, which means if they're doing a an operation every um, every um, three years if they're doing it on a three-year rotation some operations are down to an annual or you know, biannual rotation but if they're doing it on three-year rotation then twenty dollars a hectare is at least as cost effective as an aerial 1080 operation every three years so yes and, and the facts are there they're indisputable i mean when i talk with doc they say yes you're right but we're not going to publicly state that and if you go out there and state that we're going to say that you're lying you don't know what you're talking about all right. Yes, and I know um, Shane as but, well. As, you know, there can... must be a commitment over a um, a longer term contract, because what Doc's doing and Doc and Osprey are doing is they're releasing short term contracts, because the, the the bulk of the work gets done in the first year when you're setting up your infrastructure, and you're setting up the trap lines and things, and then if you do that job really well in the first year, the better you do the job in the first year, the less work you've got to do in the subsequent years. And so you can actually run at a loss. In fact, I would expect to run at a loss in the first year. And the better I did the job, the more profit I can make in the in subsequent year. So I, I would make up that loss. But what Doc and Osprey do is, is they will only release one year contracts or, or even some contracts are only three or four months long. So every single contract, the contractor is having to put in the expensive infrastructure just to get the short term contract done. So in that case there, um, the per hectare cost is higher than aerial 1080 because 
that the, the contractors aren't allowed to do what they do well over the longer term. Right. And yeah. it's also unfair because the um, the aerial 1080, when, when they when an area is designated as a, an aerial 1080 year, the planning is always done over a ten, at least a 10 or 20 year period. So the aerial 1080 contractors know that once it's designated aerial 1080, they're going to be able to pick up work over a longer period of time. So And they can budget that into their cost, which a trapper can't, you know, a short-term tra trapper can't do that. All right. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here from, from Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. So he says, how do you see trappers accessing areas in the Southern Alps that are too steep and bush covered to walk easily? Well, walking easily isn't something that a, a, a bushman thinks about. If you can walk, you can do the job. Mm. Um, we and, climbed Everest, and, didn't, didn't we? <laughs> and, and the price that, if you can walk, you can do the job. You can walk, you can do the job. You know, cliff, cliff faces, you can't do it, obviously. Well, what's but, living up on a cliff face anyway that needs to be killed? I mean... Well, in a lot of cases, you can actually catch a lot of the animals that are living on the cliff faces because they're having to come off the cliff, either to the top of it or to the bottom to actually feed. Um, yeah. so, and, and of course, they can be attracted down. So, you know, um, I mean, looking at things like super lures and, and, and even certain baits, you know, you can attract them, I suppose, down from more difficult terrain. But, but, but there are some areas like in Fiordland where it would be very difficult to operate, and I, and I accept that. But what I'm talking about is 80% of the area that's being done with aerial tenacity could be done effectively with, with ground control. And then those really steep areas, ways could be found to do it. At that point there, you, you, you then have to make decisions about cost, because the the the, the, the you know the, the tougher the, the terrain, the greater the cost. And so, the, but the the contractors will make the decision about what what they're prepared to pay. See, some younger, really fit people may be prepared to go into really remote areas just because they want to be there. And, and get paid for that experience. And so their, their, their contract rate may be competitive to an older traveler that's sort of slowing down and doesn't really want to operate that, that really rugged country. But the trappers will make that decision. If you have an output contract thing, then the trappers will tell you where the limit of where they want to operate is. And then at that point there, then you've got to work out, okay, if the trappers don't want to work in this, in this really rugged stuff, um, how are we going to go about doing it? Or can we get travellers to go in there if we pay them more? You know, if we really give them a really good financial incentive or a financial or other incentive to be in there. I mean, but, but until you know what those 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 boundary limitations are, you can't actually make those decisions. Yeah. All right. And Wayne's got one more question. Um, so, and you say that trappers relying on fur for an income could replace aerial 1080. Why is it not happening already? The possums are there now. Why are the trappers not making an impact so that 1080 is not needed? Because um, Aero 1080 is targeting very, very low possum numbers. And the, 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 the possum commodity prices are so low, it's not worth chasing them. I mean, you know, $5, you know, $100 a kilo for, for fibre is just too low for you know, professionals to chase them. That's the reason why you don't have any professionals out in the bush. There isn't that financial incentive to go chasing possums. Um, but what, what we can do, and, and there's, there's really big negative kickback from the likes of the New Zealand Fair Council and DOC and, and the government entities, um, we can uh, work at getting our skins back in the international fur skin um, auction system, which would mean that we would be lifting the average average um, you know, possum income from you know, 5 or $6 worth of fur to 50 or $60 a skin. At that point there, you'll start getting travellers into the bush doing the job that they used to do when, when skins were worth something. Yeah, and I think I've got something to say about this as well. I think that, you know, this, the system's there to collect, for example, the carcasses for, for pet food are actually, they actually need to be supported. You know, they, they need to be supported. So we have the possum man up here in Whangarei and he takes, I think, goat, venison, possum, um, a, a variety of wild harvest meats and he creates a really, really valuable um, pet food product that is sold all throughout Northland. But, you know, I think that that we need to have better systems that help to accommodate, you know, the collection of those carcasses. 
And the other thing I think, Wayne, is that we need to take into uh, um, consideration the true impacts of, of 1080. So when we actually look at the true impacts of it, you it's very becomes impossible to actually compare the damage that's being done, the wildlife that are being killed, the water that is being poisoned. Through the People's Inquiry, we have uh, had contact with a lot of people who have been harmed by inhaling aerial, you know, um, dust from aerial 1080 operations. So all of these additional factors are never taken into consideration when we're when we're weighing up these two issues. So it's you know, for me personally. 1080 actually should not be an option. It should be taken off the table when you actually start to look at the evidence of the harm that's being done. So comparing them, you know, it just, it just doesn't work. Well, well, I, I think that, you know, getting back to Wayne's, you know, I think his specific thing is um, why a trap is not able to do the job they were doing. Basically, to put it in a nutshell, Possums are simply not financially worthwhile because the prices of possum products is being kept artificially low by government controlled entities. The government doesn't want possums to be worth good money. End of story. I think um, two years ago, possum fur was worth $130 a kilo up here. It might, it might, might have been three years, maybe kind of just pre COVID. Um, and I think it's between two and three dollars. It might even be a little bit more a kilo for the actual meat itself. I think that there's there are high 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 value um, or value added aspects to this. So if if there were some support, I think to not just with the pet food, but with um, dried pet pet treat products. You know, that's a very, very valuable market and it's a very, very valuable um, resource for local communities. I mean, we, we spend a lot of money on dog food and it's it's the, the best dog food that you could get, really. It's like, you know, totally unprocessed and we need to be looking at some other ways of, of supplementing the income to make sure that it's viable as well as supporting, um, you know, in any way that we can. To make sure that these are viable options so that we can actually step into a more sustainable ethical um, and environmentally safe space you know the aerial poisoning really is such a big issue that we're being forced to look at these other ways of supporting this so that we can make this shift do we have any more questions do you have any more thoughts on that, Marty? Well, yeah, once you get communities involved and, and, and trappers are given targets, trappers are really um, strange creatures because they are really inventive and they're highly competitive. So that when they're out there, they're constantly thinking about how they can do things better. So when they go down to the pub and they're, they're talking with the, with the other guys out in the bush, they can say, oh, I, I did something better than you. I mean, that's just the way a good trapper operates. You know, it, it, it's just that competitive nature that they are. Yeah, if they've got targets and they are making a living in the bush and, and they're, they're doing things comfortably, with today's technology, they will pick up that technology and start using it in ways that, um, that, that the government's not thinking about. You know, one thing I'm thinking about is meat. The um, at, at the moment, it's not worth taking carcasses out of the native bush because everything has to be carried out on your back. But drone technology is, is, is becoming better and better and better. And, and, and the drones are able, you know, cheaper type drones are able to carry heavy and heavy loads. And once you get drones up to where they can carry, you know, sort of 100 kgs, you've actually got the ability, the cost effective ability to be able to fly carcasses out of the bush that you can't, you can't take out now. And those carcasses in the bush are actually better than farm possums in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the pine possums in that they, they are very lean meat. They don't have the, the, you know, the big fat deposits and the grease and, and, and the skin and that sort of thing. So you've got a, a, a totally new product that will be coming out in large numbers if you allow trappers to be able to just get on with you and develop and, um, and, and develop new ideas and use new technologies and ways that uh, it, just, just like you know the venison days. Nobody ever thought that anybody would be jumping out of helicopters and catching live deer, and we did it. And we found, and, and then from that, we found other ways of catching my deer, which which kickstarted the whole deer industry, which 
the Europeans said was impossible. You can't farm wild deer in the way that you farm sheep. Well, we proved you couldn't. Now, trappers are exactly that same mindset. In fact, it was the hunting fraternity that created the deer industry. And, but you just got to let trappers to get out there and do it. <laughs> and they will do things that, that are totally unexpected. Yep. Yep. All right. We're going to have to wrap up now. I see, um, Wayne, you've said, where is the evidence of harm? So I, I'm not sure if you're on our email list or not, but um, I ha I'm happy to send out some uh, information to you. And through the People's Inquiry, which Flora and Fauna has been involved in over the past three years, um, the report should be coming out, hopefully, at the beginning of next year. Um, we have been collecting submissions as well as evidence um, from people throughout the entire country um, on, on the evidence of harm. So on their personal stories, on um, affidavits from them, on things that they have witnessed, as well as scientific studies. So there is a lot of information um, and a lot of, it's a huge body of evidence, but it's it gets swept under the carpet, unfortunately, but I'm happy to provide you um, with links and information on that. I'm not sure if you want to pop your email in there or just get in touch with me. I might, I'll pop my, the Flora and Fauna email in the chat and you are welcome to um, email me and I, I would love to provide you with some information. Was there anything else you would like to say before we wrap up there, Marty? I just, just keep up the, the job of, you're doing something that I can't do. You know, you're able to communicate in ways and create an environment where different ideas can come out. And, and that's what's needed because all these ideas and these discussions have been shut down and we've got to start getting these, these discussions working again. And the way they used to, I mean, New Zealand was a really, you know, we were called the number eight wire, wire country because we would do things with a piece of number eight wire that nobody had ever thought about. And we stopped that because all those innovative way of thinking has been shut down by a government that doesn't want innovative thinking and wants everybody to do what they want to do, how they want to do it. Yeah. And certainly in the bush, the only way to get things done is to be innovative and, and, and allow oddball people to do oddball things. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, well, let's just finish with something a little bit um, on the funny side. I'm a pretty close to lifelong vegetarian of 30 years but um a couple of weeks ago I tried some possum korma it was pretty good actually <laughs> I um challenged a friend that if she could make a, um, a possum dish for our community garden day um that I would try it and she did she made a possum korma and it was actually really delicious and it tasted a lot like chicken and um yeah I mean what what can I say I think that it, if we're we're in time of adaptation and we really need to look at the you know what's available to us and and how to improve our environment you know there's no reason that people couldn't be eating possum pies instead of we're going to be able to turn you back into a carnival <laughs> probably not but look I'm, i might be a flexitarian or an adaptarian i'm kind of making that up but you know i <laughs> I just, I think this is too important. And I think that we really do need to be looking um, at, at positive alternative solutions. So with that said, thank you very much, Marty, for your time. Another great conversation and um, look forward to kind of reflecting on this, probably watching it again, having a really good think about, you know, um, the things that came up and I'd love to hear from anyone else if you have any thoughts that you want to share or any topics around, you know, related to this that you would like to know more about or you'd like to um, have discussed. There's a few other people in the works as well. We might get to talk to some of our animal liberation friends who like have totally different views on all this stuff, but that's what it's about is really opening up this space to different views um, and hearing what people have to say and seeing how we can collaborate in a more positive way. So I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to catching you next time. And thanks everyone for joining us. It's been good. Cool. And thanks for your email, Wayne. I will, I'll email you straight away. Cool. Thank you, Marty. Enjoy the rest of the day and um, yeah, catch you next time. Righto. Cool. See ya. Catch ya.